let's get started. So, um, uh, Bruce, you got uh, 40 or so uh, minutes. And, uh, so, uh, let's get started here. Okay. Uh, well, you sort of have my philosophy of things. This, this talk is going out of uh, talks with a number of people. Oliver the meeting of Jonas Salk, Colleen Montreux, that one man that wrote. And uh, it actually has to do with the fact that when I was an undergraduate and I took my first uh, large uh, course and I got graded on a curve, I was offended. And I thought, why, why get graded on a curve? And I couldn't understand. Uh, and I heard all the explanations and I didn't believe any of them. Uh, and why this should uh, be broken up into the majority of the C's and then the, the B's and D's and the A's and F's. They, why should they follow a Gaussian distribution? And then uh, after, I, after the freshman courses, I was never graded on a curve again because the classes of physics were too small. So I had never thought about it until I was a uh, graduate student and I had to grade undergraduate physics courses and I had to grade in a curve. But by that time, I understood what was wrong. And I went to uh, my uh, professor and I said, you know, we ought not to be graded on a curve and this is the reason why. And I gave this nice, elegant demonstration of why we shouldn't be grading on a curve. And he said, okay, what's your data? And I didn't have any data, so I had my first lesson in real physics. Theories are cheap if you don't back it up with data. Anyone can come up with a theory. They, they call that mathematics. Uh, so, what, what is it that you're taught? You're taught from the time of Gauss that no experiment is reproducible. No matter how good an experimentalist you are, no matter how we find your instrumentation is, you do the experiment in which you think is identical to the experiment you did before. All the conditions are identically the same. You get a different result. It may not be a big difference, but it's different enough that you cannot say that you, with inf infinite precision you've reproduced your prediction. And so the question that was addressed by the 18th century physicists was, well, what do you do with this collection of experimental results? What is the best way to characterize it? And uh, Gauss, who was that time, at that time interested in uh, astronomical observations and looking at the, trying to locate stars in the heavens, and that's the twinkling of starlight is a Gaussian distribution. And that's uh, and so he said, well, the best uh, characterization of the data is the mean. And uh, because the fluctuations are uh, bounded by physical events, they have to be finite, and therefore, uh, with those two assumptions, we get the uh, normal or Gaussian distribution. And Gauss was 19 when he did that. Then, in the 20th century, uh, mathematicians began to look at this seriously, and that came along with the central limit theory that you have a large number of identically distributed random variables added together with a finite second moment, you get a Gauss distribution. And then generalizations of that. Now, that's the simple physical world. Complexity implies that you don't, do not get this kind of distribution, but you get the kind of distribution that Alfredo Pareto was interested in. And that is that he found for the distribution of income for all different kinds of societies, and that turned out to be uh, inverse power law. And there are examples from the social, physical, and life sciences, which, which I'll give you, that have this kind of uh, inverse power law behavior because the world is fundamentally uh, complex and not simple. So this is Gauss's worldview. <laughs> And this bridge sort of stabilized is a, an example of how stable the picture of the world is. Simple rules yield simple results. Things are additive. The output is proportional to the input. 
things are predictable and the fluctuations are normal. That was Gauss's view of the world, and it's like this bridge, you know it's going to be there tomorrow and the day after is something that's really solid. And it's something that every student knows because that's what they're graded on. They have so many <laughs> C's, so many B's and D's, so many A's and S's, and they, it's repeated often enough that everyone believes it. And in social sciences, it's, sort of, it's raised to uh, a, a mythical proportion. So things behave this way. Uh, and although every student knows it's true, where is the evidence? Have you ever seen any evidence of why grades ought to be normally distributed? <laughs> Has anyone ever shown you any evidence? <laughs> Challenge your professor. Yeah, isn't it ease of grading? Isn't that the main goal? Well, the, the, the point is, is that you have to have some rationale for the distribution that you use, other than words. And so the, what you need is data to establish that that's, in fact, the distribution that you ought to use. And uh, a couple of years ago, I ran across this paper. And uh, what these guys did is they looked at the, uh, is essentially it's a college entrance exam for how well you've done in different disciplines in high school. So it's, it's like an achievement test. And it's in the social sciences, uh, physics, biology. And so you have, uh, and it, uh, this entrance exam covers all the disciplines and it's for uh, approximately 60,000 students. And so you can look at the distribution of grades. It's the first data source I've seen for this uh, distribution of grades. All right, this is the humanities. And this compares uh, students that went to day school and night school. It looks pretty Gaussian for high and low incomes. Right? Looks pretty Gaussian for private and public students still looks pretty Gaussian. So it looks like Gauss was right. You have this nice normal curve, you know, statistical error, but this is a nice normal curve for the distribution of grades. That's fine. But this is the humanities. Let's look at the at physics. Same set of students, different disciplines. There's nothing normal or Gaussian about this distribution. It's a distribution that has a long tail. Again, the separation of day and night students, high and low incomes, public school, private school, it's certainly not bell shaped. So there's something different about uh, physics. Well, what's the sample size right now? 60,000 students. Still 60,000? Yeah, it's the same 60,000 students. Okay, look at the biological sciences. Hmm. Looks much closer to the physical sciences than it does to the humanities, right? Mm -hmm. So why is it that the physical sciences and the biological sciences have these long tail distributions or heavy tail distributions and the humanities have a bell-shaped curve? Like Gauss. Well, you think about the humanities. The humanities consists of uh, language, uh, philosophy, sociology, economics. They're this amalgam of essentially independent topics that you're learning, and you're putting them all together to form what you call humanities. Well, that's like what you do as a condition for a Gaussian distribution large number of independent random variables and you add them together. Hmm. And that's why in the humanities you get a bell-shaped curve. Well, why don't you in the physical sciences? Well, it's because everything's contingent. You don't start out taking calculus-based physics. You might take algebra-based physics in high school. But then before you take calculus, you have to take algebra. And before you take algebra, you have to take arithmetic. 
Everything builds on everything else. And if you skip something in the middle, you can't go on. If there's a hole in your education, you just can't develop. So everything's interdependent. And it's the interdependency and the correlation that's in the biological sciences and in the physical sciences that means the distribution winds up having this long tail. It's the complexity of the activity that you're looking at that uh, generates the long tail. And that's what makes it fundamentally different from the humanities. So that this interdependence of memory, are the com it's the complexity that's violating the conditions for the Gaussian distribution. So the inverse power law replaces Gauss not just in the uh, education and in the distribution of grades, but essentially every place else. Because most things are complex. Most things are not simple. Okay, so what's the evidence for that? Well, here's uh, a list of 40 inverse power law networks. These are natural networks uh, from uh, the flooding of the Nile to distribution of earthquakes to asteroid hits, the frequency of asteroid hits, sunspots, genetic circuitry, uh, fetal lamb breathing, bronchial structure, heartbeats, body size of species, size distributions of ecosystems. And, and this 40 is sort of, that's just an arbitrary number. That's just to show you there's a lot of them that occur naturally. And all of these have long-tailed, heavy-tailed, or inverse power law distributions associated with the physical observable in the process. Nothing like the Gaussian distribution. Uh, but this is, these are the natural inverse power law networks. Uh, there's nothing here about uh, biological uh, this social. So here's 40 social. <laughs> That's um, another uh, number of citations, co-authorship, casualties during war, the size of villages, copies of books sold, aggressive behavior among children, labor strikes, salaries, uh, cotton prices, Italian industrial clusters. And, Whenever you look at a phenomenon and you identify the phenomenon and are able to associate a measurable quantity with that phenomenon, chances are when you do measures of that phenomenon, it's going to be inverse power. And in keeping with the philosophy of this meeting today, when you see inverse power law, you think fractal derivatives, fractal integrals, fractal equations of motion for the underlying structure. But you say that the complexity implies inverse power. Can we claim the opposite? Like whenever you see inverse power law of that, you claim it is complex. Well, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't make, I wouldn't make a mathematical claim, but I'd say you should have a strong suspicion. A suspicion. <laughs> that uh, you should immediately test about the complexity of the system. Okay, thank you. How complex does something need to be before it's complex? That's a good question. Complexity is one of those uh, words, it's uh, like St. Augustine said about time. He says, I know what time is until someone asks me what it is. And then all of a sudden I no longer know what it is. Meaning that it's one of those words that's experiential in nature. And because it's experiential, you have an intuition about it, an experience about it. So you know what it is. But if I have to re give a reductionistic dictionary definition of what it is, there are so many conditionals that you have to attach to it that it ceases to have any real meaning. In the context that I'm talking about, I'll define for convenience a system as complex when it's described by an inverse power law. That reminds me of Tao Te Ching in ancient Chinese Lao, Laos. They said, um, uh, uh, how to say? Well, when the Tao is, when you speak, when you speak about it, uh, 
It's not a mean when you speak about it, something like that. Yes, right. <laughs> you can you can appreciate it, but as as soon as, as soon as you begin to talk about it, you're no longer talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something <laughs> talk, but all face have done. And so we talked a lot about inverse power laws, but okay. and and that it's different from Gaussian distributions. And so, what are the implications of that? Do you have a real visceral feeling for what that means? I mean, most people don't. Right? All right, it's a different distribution. The mean is different, so I change the parameters, and they really don't have uh, an intuition about what it means. Right? Now, this is a, an intuition that every faculty member will resonate with. Mm, right? Okay. This is from De Solo Price, Little Science, Big Science, 1963. And this is a number of citations to publications, mm. and this essentially uh, is a, people use a measure for how much paper you've published has influenced other people because they refer to your paper. They cite your paper in something they've published. Okay? And so, the and this is an average over all science publications in a given year. And the average number of citations per year is 3.2. Okay? It's an inverse power law distribution. It's 1 over x cubed. And now you begin to look and say, the first 35% of all papers published have zero citations. The next 49% of all papers published have one citation. By the time you get out to the average number of citations, you've exhausted 96% of all the papers published. And what you very often find in a, a tenure committee meeting or a promotion committee meeting, they'll say, how significant is your work? And say, well, I have the average number of citations to my paper. Oh, that's not really very good. Because they're thinking Gauss. Gaussian. In the Gaussian world, when you have the average number, you have, you're like most other people. There's some that publish a little more than you. There's some that publish a little less than you. But if you're doing average, you're doing sort of what everybody else is doing. In the world of Pareto, which is the world we live in, when you do the average, you've already excluded 96% of what everybody else is doing. You're out in the 4% four per, four tail. So when you're doing average, you're exceptional. You're not like everybody else. The average doesn't represent the distribution. If you use the average to represent the distribution, it's a total distortion of what's going on. So we don't live in a Gaussian world. We live in a Pareto world. We live in a complex world, not a simple world. And yet, if you analyze the kinds of assessments that people make, they mentally believe they're living in a Gaussian world. Because they want the world to be fair. Everyone should make approximately the same amount of money. Well, Pareto learned that he has this kind of distribution, so these people make most of the money. The world is fundamentally unfair. There's an imbalance. And the question is, is that imbalance necessary or is it imposed? You do some mathematical modeling of that and what you find, if you want a social system to be stable, the imbalance is necessary. If you try to have this utopian ideal of everybody doing the same and getting the same amount and having the same amount of recognition and no one being a star, the system becomes unstable. It's untenable. It doesn't work that way. It only works that way in Gauss's world. And so when people start telling you about how it ought to be, if you examine what they say, they're talking about the world according to Gauss. Mm -hmm. and not the world according to Pareto. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so this is the, the figure I had uh, before, but it's worth reviewing. The difference is a linear and a nonlinear world. In the linear world, the output is proportional to the input. In the nonlinear world, small changes may diverge. It's the example I gave where everything's on the edge of the table and you have a very small input and you have a very large output. That can't be described 
by a linear model. It's a nonlinear effect. The, the book, The Tipping Point, which is excellent, is about the sociological phase transitions, essentially, that Malcolm wrote. That the world is, is fundamentally multiplicative, not additive. That simple rules yield complex results. You can have a simple mapping, like the logistics map, that gives rise to chaos, unpredictable behavior, or behavior of uh, limited predictability. That the world is unstable, not stable. All you have to do is look at the stock market. Uh, and that qualitative uh, can be as important as, as quantitative. At, at a time when uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was publishing his uh, treatise on optics and talking about how you can pass light through a prism and get the, the, the spectrum of colors, Goethe who as a poet, philosopher, botanist, was also a scientist. He wrote a book on optics, which was very different from the book that Newton wrote. And in his book on optics, what he said is that you cannot understand sunlight in a laboratory. You can only understand sunlight in a garden. And by that he meant that when you have these complex phenomena, you cannot take it out of their natural context to understand it. You have to understand it in the context in which you find the phenomenon. Uh, it didn't work particularly for sunlight. That turned out to be a bad example because sunlight is basically linear. It's just the linear superposition of the different frequencies of the spectrum. But the principle was correct. The principle being that if you want to understand something like the human heart, you don't extract it from the person to understand it. You understand it while it's still beating, while it's alive, while it's in its natural setting. And that's looking at these uh, systems with inverse power law distributions and not the normal distribution. So it's not what you expected. So inverse power laws are strange because most workers earn less money than average. Uh, most investigators publish fewer pay papers than average. Most scientists are cited fewer times than average. Most speakers use fewer words than average. Most people live in larger cities than average. Uh, most emergency ward patients stay in hospitals less time than average. And most damage is caused by fewer failures than average. And, and you could sort of extend this list uh, almost infinitely because the average never characterizes a complex phenomenon. And when you attempt to do that, which is done every day in the majority of science papers that are published, it's a mistake. Okay, so if you don't have an average, what can you do? If that doesn't characterize the process, uh, what can you do? So, and what you do is you use the slope of this inverse power law, which is a scaling index. And that slope measures the extent of the imbalance I was talking about and the degree of unfairness I was talking about. It also measures the degree of variability in the process that you're looking at. And very often, the more important feature of the process is the degree of variability. And that as uh, in people, as you get uh, ill or you have uh, you contract a disease, what happens is that you lose the variability. And that's reflected in a change in slope. And that loss of variability is what we call illness. And the slope is also related to the fractional dimension. So that uh, disease is not the loss of regularity as uh, most physicians believed for a very long time is actually the loss of complexity. And you can generalize this to, uh, to disease, you can think of, uh, uh, of system failure, of, of whatever the system you're looking at. When it's healthy and operating the way it ought to be operating, then it has the, a kind of normal variability associated with it. And when it's unhealthy, about to break down or to fail, you lose that and you lose the complexity of the, of the system you're looking at. Sort of like an ecosystem. Most healthy ecosystems yeah. are very complex, but when you reduce it to just a few species, 
They're very susceptible when they can crash. Yes. And very often what will happen is that well-intentioned people will come in and they'll see that, uh, oh, this is toxic to the system. And they don't recognize that that toxicity is also part of the variability that's associated with it. And they'll remove the toxicity. And what will happen is that one part of the ecosystem that was being controlled by the toxicity will blossom and take off and it will set, uh, It'll, it could suffocate another part of the system by overfeeding and so on. And so the ecosystem could break down by removing something which you thought was harmful to it. And it wasn't harmful. It was uh, a negative input, but it was a necessary negative input to regulate. So you have to be very cautious when you approach these complex systems about how you attempt to control or regulate them because it's not at all obvious how any change will play through the system and what the system response will be to that change. So the control mechanisms are not obvious. Okay, so the conclusion is that uh, complex phenomena are described by the statistics of Pareto, not Gauss, the inverse power laws. The scaling of complex phenomena imply that scaling indices, not the averages, better characterize the process. And that most physiological phenomena are complex and described by inverse power laws so that the average is uh, truly exceptional. So if people call you average, smile. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here we are all and feel very happy about being an average. So. <laughs> That, that's excellent. So I like uh, many of the statements in your talk. Like, uh, so this average may characterize complex phenomena. So. So great. And